much for a link of that speech. I happen to be a former student of this in one of my classes in Southeast Asian Security. Um, my next speaker is Sarah Bishop, PhD candidate in the ANU College of Law, with her thesis topic examining the role that the Thai courts have in giving effect to rights provisions in the, the three recent Thai constitutions. Um, she will be speaking on the judicial aspect of the coup, its kind of the coup, and how they might how they may impact prospects for democracy within Thailand. So, Ms. Bishop, you may have the floor. Thailand has a long history of coups and an established elite coup culture, and these pose significant obstacles to establishment of fully-fledged democracy within Thailand. However, in my opinion, there is one feature of the latest coup which distinguishes it from past coups and provides some hope that this cycle may soon be broken. And that is the fact that this most recent coup did not come out of the blue, did not come as soon as political conflict emerged, but rather was preceded by extended efforts to resolve issues of political conflict through resort to formal legal mechanisms. Now, it is not my intention today to argue or to imply that the courts or the law can be a panacea to Thailand's political problems, or that the courts will always act in the interests of democracy. However, when one looks at the history of coups in Thailand, I think there is one reason, additional to those mentioned by Nick, which explains why coups have been able to occur again and again. And that is the lack of institutions able to meaningfully resolve political conflicts through formal means before they escalate to levels that extraordinary measures are necessary. And, in my opinion, when one looks to the events of 2006 to 2014, there is evidence in these events that the Thai courts are starting to develop into an institution which, in the present, or at least in the very near future, may be able to fulfil this role. Certainly, when one looks to the period 2006 to 2014, it is clear that in this period, the courts, at the very least, were providing an avenue for channeling political conflict. The nature of political cases that came before the courts in this period was very diverse. Certainly there was extensive use of the courts by anti-Tuxin allied political groups. And these led to many of the court decisions of which most of you are probably aware decisions such as the dissolution of the People's Power Party in 2008. Decisions such as those that led to the dismissal of Prime Ministers Samak and Ying Luck, and the multiple decisions which blocked constitutional amendments proposed by the Pua Thai Party in the period 2012 to 2014. Perhaps less well known, certainly less obvious from the face of the media, but immediately apparent upon inspecting the court record is that in this period there was also extensive use of the courts by Tuxin allied groups. And use of the courts by Tuxin allied groups for purposes similar to those um, by the anti Tuxin groups to try and resolve political conflicts, to have their political opinions heard. So, cases challenging the legitimacy of the upper sit government, cases challenging the ability of the Democrat led government to introduce constitutional amendments, and most recently, a very extensive series of cases trying to block protests by the PDRC and similar protest groups within Bangkok. So, in the period 2006 to 2014, I think it is indisputable that the courts were channeling political conflict. They were being used by both sides, and in fact, there were very few significant political conflicts which did not make it to the courts. But of course, providing an avenue for channeling conflict alone is not enough to ensure that that conflict does not escalate to unmanageable status. It's also necessary that the courts, or whatever the institution is, shows potential to resolve that conflict, to mediate and moderate it in a meaningful way that dissipates, or at the very least, lessens conflict, lessens tension. 
In this area, I think the ability of the courts to fulfil this role in the period 2006 to 2014 is less clear. Certainly, there has been very extensive criticism of the judgments of the court in the period, and in particular, of the judgments of the Constitutional Court, with many of the court's decisions in the most prominent cases being labelled with the extreme end as judicial coups, implying that they are completely without legitimacy. However, whilst there is no doubt that many decisions of the court were poorly reasoned and poorly justified from a legal perspective, and that there were some indicators of potential judicial bias within many of the formal judgments, with things such as, with, with language such as dictatorship of the majority, assembly of the relatives, or an attempt to lead the nation back into the canal, appearing in what was supposed to be neutral legal judgments. And although the impacts of many of the judicial decisions were deeply problematic from political, administrative and human rights perspectives, for instance, if one looks at the 2008 case which led to the dissolution of the People's Power Party, clearly it was problematic from a human rights perspective, as politicians who were not shown to have been personally involved in any misconduct had their political rights, their rights to be active citizens within the Thai nation revoked for five years, with no means of personal recourse and no means throughout the process to defend themselves and to argue for why they should retain those rights in a personal capacity. How it's not only problematic from a human rights perspective, it's also problematic from political and administrative perspectives. Because clearly when you're removing over 100 of the nation's most senior politicians from office, without proof of personal misconduct, you are not improving the calibre of politicians who are governing the nation. You are not improving the, the ability of Parliament to come up with good policy. You are not improving the ability of parties to contend on an equal and legitimate basis. That's just one example. However, I would say that although the decisions of the period were not neutral and were often highly problematic in practical terms, there was within them usually at least some element of compromise, some way in which the judiciary failed to go as far as protesters were demanding they should, as either side of politics. So for instance, if one looks at the 2014 decisions which led to invalidation of the general election and to dismissal of Yin Luck, one can be seen that although the election was invalidated, as protesters were demanding it must be, it was not invalidated as they claimed it should be on grounds that the government could not legitimately call an election, on grounds that political conflict was such that to have an election would be meaningless, but on the relatively formal grounds that on the day of the election, candidates had not been registered in all electorates, meaning that elections could not be held universally throughout the country. Now, this is an important distinction to make because this meant that it was still possible for the government to call and to hold elections that might subsequently be held valid. And if one looks to the Ying Luck decision, although the court dismissed Ying Luck and some other ministers, as was asked that the court did, the court stopped short of fully dismissing the Ying Luck government or of dismissing all cabinet members. So it was still possible for that government to continue to function albeit with reduced capacity due to significant reductions in number of people able to perform necessary functions. A vacuum was not created. Politics could still at some level continue. There was still some possibility of a legal way out. So, yes, the decisions were in many ways problematic, but their impacts were certainly less severe than those of a fully-fledged military coup. Yes, many resulted in dismissal, of governments or of prime ministers. And yes, many resulted in modifications of the rules of the political game as they were understood prior to the decision. However, they did not, and I do not think a judicial decision can, lead to a whole scale rewriting of the rules of the political game in the way that a military coup can. And I think perhaps because of this, the judicial decisions in the period, despite their imperfections, despite the fact that they were very widely criticised, was still at some level accepted, was still generally abided by, and because of this, helped to dispel, delay, to dispel tensions and to delay more serious action. 
And this, in a period of very high politicisation and polarisation, in a period in which it was very difficult to find any middle ground which would be accepted by all sides. So I think that this provides a very positive development for Thailand, one which hasn't really been seen in the past. It provides an indication that maybe in the future, when we get into these situations, there may be a way through that does not result, involve military intervention, that does not involve resort to extra legal means. Now, of course, whilst I paint here a positive picture, the fact of the coup and developments in the post-coup period must also be considered, and they do not, perhaps, bode so well. In particular, the ready ascent of the courts to military encroachment on their role has been remarkable. The courts of justice, in contrast, to their strong opposition to establishment of administrative courts and constitutional courts throughout the 1990s, in the aftermath of the 2014 coup, have very readily accepted the military shifting some civilian cases into the jurisdiction of the military courts. This suggests that the courts in this period may more readily suggest encroachment on their role in monitoring governance in monitoring protection of rights than they have in past periods. And the administrative courts, similarly negative signs, with the hierarchy in the administrative courts explicitly seeking direction from the junta on how they should continue to act, casting serious doubts on their conception of personal judicial identity and on their capacity to act as an independent institution able to monitor actions of government. Still, despite these more recent negative developments, which I think do have to be acknowledged and given full weight, I think the fact that the courts were willing in the 2006 to 2014 period to assume and to play the role that they did is a positive development. And I also think that the failures of the courts in this period to do better than they did is at least partially attributable to formal structures in place in that period. In particular, I think that post-2007, in particular, ability of judges to maintain a reputation as neutral, non-political arbitrators was significant by the fact that they were given responsibility for performing expressly political functions, such as appointing members to independent constitutional bodies, and potentially, if they chose to do so, suggesting legal reforms. I think the ability of the constitutional court, in particular, um, to establish a reputation as a neutral body was significantly affected by conferring of the court on broad ancillary powers and very narrow judicial review powers, which meant that almost every case the court decided was a politicised case, with the court given very little opportunity to rule in less controversial cases where it might have been able to gain more general acceptance for the role it played. I also think that the Constitutional Court was disadvantaged by conferring on it of responsibility to rule in often, in cases that often were very fact intensive. They required it to hear evidence as to what had and had not been done and to rule on that matter. A function to which apex courts are generally poorly suited because they don't have the same facilities um, at hand as lower courts. They do not have the same expertise in these areas as lower courts. In the case of the Constitutional Court in particular, which, like constitutional courts throughout the world, has some non-legal representatives, some political representatives, those representatives in particular, will push those types of issues. Um, I also think that the courts in this period were handicapped by some of the legal rules which they had to apply, rules which really gave them very little discretion in how to act. Basically, if they found the facts to be one way, they had to impose a particular penalty. They had limited scope to consider severity, limited scope to consider the appropriateness of the remedy in that particular circumstance, and also limited need to justify why they were acting as they were. Because the rules being as prescriptive as they were, the courts could simply say, the rules say I must act this way, therefore I act this way. I had more discretion that would impose probably a requirement to give clearer, stronger 
reason. So, I think that developments in the 2006 to 2014 period show that the courts may be moving towards becoming an institution that can help resolve this issue of the cycle of coups, can perhaps help fill the vacuum when there is not a strong charismatic monarch to resolve these conflicts as they emerge and escalate, and can make it more difficult for the military in the future to intervene at will. For this to happen, I think it is necessary that the courts retain powers to decide political conflicts, but that there be some important amendments made to the manner in which they do so. Since the coup, Freyut and Hunter have frequently spoken of the need for judicial reform. What form their judicial reforms take will significantly impact the prospects for the future of democracy within Thailand.